Okay. All right. Well, let's get rolling. Um, like always, if the space crashes, everybody just hang out for like 90 seconds and I'll make a new one. But the hope is that it'll just work. Um, we got a good amount of questions uh, submitted for this one. Um, as always, uh, we're going to be hopefully doing this weekly. But if you have questions, I put out a Google form each beginning of the week. So you can fill that out. Um, but I'm going to roll right into it because um, I think that there's a couple of good questions. So the first one I'm going to start off with was, Jonah, why do you invest in small caps? Um, actually, I think I asked that question myself, didn't I? <laughs> I think that was my you might have you might have submitted it. <laughs> I think I submitted it myself just to throw it out there because it does come up a lot. People ask me, you know, why don't I have any large caps in my portfolio? Do I not think there's opportunity in large caps? Um, you know, I'm I'm an aggressive investor by trade. Uh, I like risk. I like volatility. I mean, I was an entrepreneur the last ten years, so I just think that risk is built into my DNA, and you know, I can accept it and happy to ride through it. And if you can you know, if you can handle the risk and the volatility with small caps, I still believe that that's where you have the the greatest opportunity to, uh, you know, put up big returns compared to large caps. Um, you know, look what Facebook and Apple did last night. You know, they both reported phenomenal numbers and the stocks are up. You know, the stocks are up decent. I think Facebook was up 7% this morning. I think maybe up 5% right now. Uh, I haven't looked at Apple, but I mean, those are, you know, Facebook's now a trillion dollar company. Apple's now a two trillion dollar company. And I know there's, you know, hundreds of other large caps out there. I'm just using those two as, as the extreme example. But, you know, what could Apple be in three years? I mean, could they get to a uh, three trillion dollar company? Yeah, perhaps. But I also think that my some of my best small cap ideas have the potential to put up 30, 40, 50% annual returns, um, in some cases more than that. I mean, if you can find a stock that turns into a, a 10 bagger over five years, uh, I believe it's a fifth, I'd have to double check. I think it's a 58 and a half percent compounded annual growth rate. Uh, you know, obviously it's pretty hard to find those stocks and it's hard to stick with them, but I just think the greatest opportunity for me as an investor is small caps, but you know, there's a lot more risk and it's not just around earnings because there's less analyst covering, but you do have to worry about dilution through secondary offerings. You have to worry about uh, the short sellers, of course. So it's not it's not for the faint of heart. And I do think that a lot of people that even if they love small caps and think that's where the best opportunity is, I wouldn't recommend that the majority of people have all of their capital in small caps. I'm comfortable with it. And I have a few small I, I mean, I have a I have a couple mid caps and a couple large caps, so I'm not 100 percent small caps. But I think the average investor should be diversified across, uh, you know, each of these asset classes or or asset styles, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. So, you know, a mix of large cap, small cap, mid cap, and then even some growth in value, you know, and then obviously some U.S. and international. So, you know, hit up hit up all those style boxes. Don't just you know, don't just stay in one style box. Got it. Got it. Appreciate that. This next question is a little bit. <clears throat> a little bit longer, but I think it's really applicable to a lot of people in the audience, so I'll read it out. So they submitted and said, I'm a relatively new investor with about nine months of total experience. When I invest, I don't read too much into the technicals and charts. I don't pretend to be an expert there. If I like the company's product, mission, and find what I feel is a good price point, I pull the trigger on what I assume will be a three-year minimum investment. I've gotten a good shake in early with Neo, Mara, and Caterpillar so far, but this won't last forever. How can I start to understand instead of guesstimate what an ideal price point will be before I start a position? Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's hard. I mean, it depends on it's company specific. It's overall market specific. It's industry specific, industry specific. Um, you know, I've always said that, you know, I'm looking for high growth companies with strong fundamentals and attractive entry prices. Uh, sometimes you're going to end up overpaying in the short term. You know, you end up chasing a stock afraid that it might not pull back to your your target entry price. Sometimes you might wait for a stock to pull back to a moving average, whether it's the 10 day, the 20, the 50, the 100, the 200. Um, doesn't mean it's going to happen. And it doesn't mean that it's going to bounce off of one of those moving averages like you want it to. I mean, st stocks sometimes have a mind of their own. Markets have a mind of their own. You know, small caps are getting sold off today, probably from the 10 year treasury ticking up. I mean, even though GDP numbers were strong, you know, even though there's some inflation and Powell said he's not going to raise rates because he's not worried about it. 
you know, it doesn't mean that the market's not going to interpret the data and his words differently. So, you know, but this, you know, I, I had some cash in my account from selling a couple stocks uh, er, earlier this week. So I'm, I'm happy to see a red day because that's when I prefer to add to my positions. So, for instance, today I got back into Danimer and App Harvest. I had gotten into both of these stocks earlier this year. I rode them up. I rode them down. I sold both of them, you know, in the big uh, growth SPAC sell off in early March, took uh, some small losses in both. And then I waited for these stocks to bottom out and got back into both of them today with small positions. I mean, these these are still just um, about one and a quarter percent each. Um, so that's what I do on days like today is I'm happy, you know, happy to add to these stocks. I, in terms of like a chart, I mean, there really wasn't any, sig- you know, technical signal that told me to get into either of these stocks today. Um, but these are stocks that I still want to own for the next couple of years if I can. Doesn't mean I'm not going to trade around them. I think that's what people have a hard time grasping. And that's when I tend to get the most hate mail or hate messages or dumbass tweets from people is, you know, just because you love a stock for the next two, three, five, ten years doesn't mean that you shouldn't trade around it. You should be trying to use some of those rips or the volatility to your benefit. Um, you know, for instance, a couple of days ago when Dermtech was up 30 percent pre-market, you know, because it looked like, you know, according to several sources, it looked like Cigna was going to start covering uh, Dermtech's patches So, I mean, the, you know, the buying pre-market was just insane. And then over the course of the day, it looked like maybe that news was actually incorrect. Uh, The stock started drifting lower. And then after the market closed, Cigna came out and said it was not true, even though they adjusted, um, you know, they added Dermtech to their, their coverage policy. They said it's not technically covered yet. So I'm still a little confused. Obviously, the analyst was a little confused. You know, should I have sold some Derm Tech when it was up 30% pre-market? Probably. I mean, that probably would have been the prudent thing to do. But I'd also sent out a tweet and I didn't want to look like I was trying to pump a stock up and then sell it. But it was still one of my top three or four positions. And, you know, looking back, I probably should have trimmed it a little bit, you know, because then the stock pulled back 20% from, you know, hit 54 pre-market ended up closing the day or, you know, at least after hours, I think it dipped down to 41, you know, now it's sitting around 4250. So, you know, I I think people need to like, even though I say I'm a long-term investor, uh, people need to get that out of their head. When you buy a stock, it doesn't mean you have to be married to it forever. It doesn't mean that you can't trim it from time to time or take some profits uh, and wait for a pullback if you think the stock has gotten overextended. And I should have done more of that in February and March. You know, for me, the challenge is, you know, I have a Substack newsletter. I run a stock to its room. Is it like, is it kosher for me to do a write up on a stock? Uh, then over the next three or four weeks, the stock is up 30, 40%, not necessarily because of my newsletter. Maybe that's one of the factors, but it could be multiple factors. The stock's up 30, 40%. You know, at that point, should I trim some as the prudent thing to do? Or is it, you know, not cool for me to trim a stock just because I wrote about it and loved it a a month earlier. And like, that's where I need to really kind of get past that and stop worrying about what people say or what people think, or, you know, the haters or whatever else and do what's right for me. And if that means that I have to trim stocks that I love long-term and take some profits, then so be it. And if people want to bitch and moan about it, they can go, they can go F off because I'm just, I'm sick of hearing it. You know, the, the amount of bullshit that's been on Twitter the last month, is unfreaking believable. Like there are certain days where Twitter has just become a complete cesspool of hate and harassment and finger pointing. And, you know, too many investors got a little taste of gains last year. And now they think it's really easy. And anyone out there recommending stocks, um, you know, must have some magic formula or crystal ball. And if you chase them into their ideas, God forbid that those stocks don't go up every day. You know, and as soon as you start losing money on a position, you have to go find the person that recommended it and start pointing the finger at them like it's their fault. So, like, we, we need to clean that clean that crap yeah. up. I mean, I, I, I do a lot of blocking on Twitter now. Like, I just I just don't have patience for it. Like, I, I don't want to see it. Like, if you bitch once to me, like, I'm going to block you. I'm not because I'm not going to wait for you to bitch and moan a second or third time and put me in a bad mood. Like, I just 
I don't have time for it. We're all big boys and girls. Make your own decisions. Do your own due diligence. I'm out here doing the best job I can. I think everyone else is too. Sometimes we're going to be wrong. But then at the same time, like if I say that I'm in a stock for the next five years, it doesn't mean I'm going to be in that stock every single day for the next five years. Uh, it also doesn't mean that it doesn't mean Definitely. that if I say mm-hmm. I'm, I love this stock for the next five years, that you should judge me on the performance of that stock after five days. So like people. Right. <laughs> there's yeah, there's a long term approach which doesn't get necessarily satisfied by the instant no, gratification of, of Twitter. Uh yeah. And also, right, like what you're talking about here is a lot of swing trading, um, moving with in and out of stocks that you like, but, you know, being tactical about it. Right. Uh, when there's that 30 <clears> percent <throat> jump, you might want to take some profit. Doesn't mean that you're not going to add back to that stock, you know, once it decreases. Um, I, and I appreciate that approach as well. All right. Let's let's touch on a couple of individual stocks that we were asked about. Um, so the first one's going to come from Max, who's actually here listening. And he wanted to hear your thoughts on Ozone. Um, he mentioned you might have sold uh, off of some of your position of Ozone um, last month and just wanted to hear your yeah, outlook I, on so it. So over the over the past couple of weeks, I closed out positions in a few stocks, which I you know actually took profits in them, which is nice. Uh, Ozone was one of them. Shockwave Medical was another. Um, uh, in Mode was the third. I'm trying to think which ones. I think those are the three big ones. Um, I mean, I still love all three stocks. I wouldn't have been in them otherwise. But I mean, to be honest, those stocks actually held up really, really well. Uh, you know, through the growth sell-off and and into this month. Uh, Shockwave I sold the other day at an all-time high. The stock was up. I think 56% year to date when I sold it. And, you know, when you start to look at the price, the sales multiple on the stock after it's up 56% month to date, I just wasn't really that comfortable with the, the price, the sales multiple on shockwave and felt like maybe it was about to pull back. Um, so I sold it, took some profits, reallocated the cash. And if shockwave pulls back 20%, I'd probably jump back in. Uh, ozone. I was actually just mentioning to my friend this morning, I kind of, kind of regret selling it. Um, very strong company. I, I ran a screener last night for stocks under 20 billion market cap with expected revenue growth of 40% this year, next year, and the following year. And, you know, there's probably 40 or 50 stocks that came through. 70% of them were probably, you know, biotech and pharmaceutical companies that are, you know, obviously kind of hit or miss at that stage. But one of the ones that came through again was Ozone. So, I mean, it just goes to show how strong the company is in terms of penetrating e-commerce in Russia. Um, I mean, this is probably, you know, for someone that didn't get into uh, Mercado Libre maybe four years ago, three years ago, you know, I would say Ozone is kind of at that stage right now. Uh, I'm curious to see kind of which path they take if they really try to stay, you know, like straight along that e-commerce marketplace path or they take the C limited path, which is, you know, kind of not just e-commerce, but also getting into payments and gaming and uh, other services. So, but I mean, if someone's looking for, you know, international e-commerce, I mean, those are really the players that I still like. I mean, if if I was running a large cap fund, I would still own C, I would still own Melly. uh, I would definitely still have some ozone in there. So nothing wrong with the company. It was just a matter of, the stock held up so well in the pullback that I wanted to sell it at the high and take that cash and allocate it to some of my stocks that were down 30, 40 percent from the highs that I felt like I felt like those stocks that had pulled back more would probably perform better over the next two to three months. You know, if we get some sort of a bounce back. Um, but that's just that's just how I move money around. Doesn't mean it's right. I could be completely wrong and Ozone could go to 100 and my other stocks could stay where they were. But um you know, just in the moment, it felt like the right thing to do. Got it. Appreciate that insight into that. And I'm sure Max enjoyed that as well. Uh, real quick, just for everyone listening, um, you know, Jonah, you can see who he is, but my name is Gov Blacksburg and I'm the COO at Wolf Financial and also the chief Twitter user. And if you are uh, interested in learning more about Wolf, as Jonah said to quote Jonah, it's where the cool people talk about stocks. Nobody has given Jonah any shit about stocks <laughs> on Wolf. So feel free to check out check out the link in my bio. Um, we'd love to have you join our community. And if you're enjoying these Twitter spaces, feel free to join the Wolfpack here on Twitter. I basically have I have six of these next week. Uh, two of them are Max's, but I'll be doing them 
uh, with him. One of them I'll be hosting with him. One of them I'll just be a speaker on. But Jonah will also be a speaker on that. So I have a public Google Calendar you can check out and you can just you know continue to join my community. I love having you all here and it's fantastic interacting with you. And if you have questions, um, I'm not going to be bringing people up to speak on this, but feel free to uh, tweet it out and tag me and I will see it. I have a couple screens up and I'm going to see everything. All right, let's roll into a couple of other names. So Jonah, um, can you tell us right now, what are the top at three holdings in your portfolio and maybe just like a I, you know some people are saying like there's this idea of a one tweet thesis what's like the one sentence thesis behind each of them um not going to dive too deep into them because i'm sure you do tons of analysis on them all day but just like what's the top three right now in the one sentence like two sentence of thesis? my top holdings right now uh so yeah upstart is an ai powered underwriting platform that allows small and mid-sized banks to have a, a kind of digital first interface for the customer or consumer powered by this uh, this AI software that Upstart has been developing over the last seven or eight years that uses 1,600 data points to determine the credit worthiness of the potential borrower versus the old way of doing things, which is the, you know, the FICO scores. So just a much, much better uh, it's faster, it's cheaper, it's more accurate. Uh, it's supposed to be non-biased, you know, because it's really based on the data. Uh, and it's not just, like I said, it's not just FICO. Fi I think FICO might be in there, but it's obviously a ton of stuff besides that. And uh, they have these bank partners that help um, facilitate these loans. And the banks that they've been working with over the last few years have said that they're able to issue twice as many loans using upstart with uh with fewer defaults so uh I'm, I'm i'm very i mean if you're looking for a fintech uh i'm very i'm still very bullish on upstart even though the stock is up to well was it 105 right now it came into the year around 40 so what is that up about two and a half times year to date i mean it was up at about 165 a couple weeks ago after they raised guidance for 2021 so i mean you have a company that's already raised guidance for 2021 to 500 million in revenue 84 percent gross margins 46 percent contribution margins uh they just did an acquisition of a company called prodigy which is going to help them get into auto loans uh which is a much much bigger market than what they're doing right now in in personal loans so I'm, I'm still very bullish, which is why it's my, my largest position right now. Uh, second position right now, I mean, these, these three or four names kind of flip-flop. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, over the last couple of days, they've kind of flip-flop positions just based on intraday performance. But right now, Derm Tech is number two. So I think a lot of people that follow me on Twitter probably know that I've been a big bull on Derm Tech since I did a write-up on it back in January. Uh, right now, their product on the market is... Yeah, it's called it's their PLA product, which stands for pigmented lesion essay. And then they just announced that they're rolling out PLA plus, which is a more accurate version of that with another indicator. And it's for early melanoma detection. So rather than having to get the scalpel uh, where, you know, a piece of your skin is essentially cut out and analyzed and 90 percent of the time comes back negative. So. I mean, over 4 million biopsies are done every year. And if 90% of them are coming back negative, that's obviously a lot of people that got cut for, you know, cut unnecessarily. So Dermtech can help eliminate some of those unnecessary biopsies. And essentially the, this, these patches, which are the size of a quarter, are being used to non-invasively extract some of your skin cells. And then those patches are sent to California where Dermtech has a processing lab and those skin cells are analyzed. And then the dermatologist gets a report on whether or not there's anything uh, suspicious or to be worried about in the report or, or in the in the cells that were extracted. So it's just a it's a better way to detect skin cancer earlier rather than using the scalpel. And then I just did a Twitter thread today about Luminate, which is their new product that launches later this year. Uh, and that's going to be for anybody that wants to get a, a, you know, a DNA skin analysis to help determine how much uh, damage has been done to your skin by, by the sun, essentially UVs. Um, and then, you know, there'll be a, a report that comes with that. And then at the end of the report, there's apparently going to be some recommendations on how to better protect your skin or repair your skin, which is why I think they've, they've, they've alluded to these relationships with companies like L'Oreal and Johnson and Johnson, 
Um, so, you know, perhaps I, I don't know the exact relationship and how those partnerships will work. I don't know if if their products will be specifically recommended in these reports and then maybe Derm Tech gets some sort of an affiliate fee or, you know, those companies are paying to be part of the recommendation. I'm not really sure. I, I hope Derm Tech, Derm Tech makes money off it somehow, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, but then Derm Tech is already, mm-hmm. you know, John Doback on, on my interview with him about a month ago said that, you know, Luminate and basically all of their products are allowing them to build the, you know, the most, the largest database of skin data in the world, which they can then use to, uh, I don't know if they're selling the data or renting the data. I'm not, you know, I don't want to put words in their mouths, but either way, that data can be used by, you know, the biotech companies, uh, the pharma companies to help develop um, better drugs and better treatments for skin conditions. So, you know, there's a lot, a lot of different ways right. that Dermtech is going to win. So it's, you know, it's the current PLA product. It's Luminate, which comes later this year. And the next year we should get Carcinome, which is their genomics patch for the other two types of skin cancer, uh, basal and squamous. Um, so that's my second largest position. Uh, FUTU is my third largest position. I think people have heard me talk about FUTU before as well. Uh, I actually have a call tomorrow morning with the FUTU marketing team to talk about a couple things with them and then possibly uh, set up an interview with their CEO, which would be exciting because I'm obviously pretty bullish on the stock. Uh, it's, you know, the best way to think about it is like the, the Chinese version of Robin Hood uh, based in Hong Kong, extremely strong fundamentals. Last year, they grew at about 212%. This year, they'll grow at probably 120 to 130%, if not more. Uh, Phenomenal gross margins, phenomenal EBITDA margins, phenomenal net income margins. Net income margins this year should be pretty close to 50%, which is unheard of for a company growing that fast. So that means there's a lot of free cash flow coming to the balance sheet. They did do a stock offering a couple weeks ago, which I didn't love. Um, because they priced it much lower than what the stock price was at, but they did it in order to beef up the balance sheet and be able to offer their customers more margin. And if you know anything about stock trading, you know, if customers have more margin, it allows them to do more trading, more options, which generates more fees and revenues for, uh, for the company in this case, Futu. So, you know, it's not like Futu needed to raise that $1.3 billion because they were burning cash. You know, it's just the opposite. I mean, they're going to use that cash to really uh, fuel their current operations, increase revenues and and even improve margins, which is hard to believe. But we'll probably see that as well. So I, I think Futu is at least a two hundred dollar stock by the end of the year and maybe maybe two fifty if they really crush the numbers. Uh, fourth, largest, fourth largest position mm-hmm. is Mohawk. Uh, once again, I did a roundtable a couple weeks ago with. Um, Asher Delug, who is one of the co-founders of Mohawk, and Sean Emery from Avery and Company. He's one of the top 25 institutional shareholders on Mohawk. Mohawk is basically an, an AI-enabled CPG company that uses e-commerce for, I mean, I think 100% of their sales right now, primarily Amazon. Um, although they are doing some stuff with Walmart and they actually just got a few of their product lines onto Target, Target's website. And then they have a a Shopify website for all of their other brands. And it's just, you know, there's two pieces to the story. One of which is using this AI system that they developed called Amy, uh, to identify trends and opportunities on Amazon that are not being met by current products and then work with their overseas manufacturing partners to develop products and deploy those products on Amazon and hope to fill that gap uh, and benefit from that trend moving forward. And then the second part of the story is M&A. So once again, using Amy, they can identify trends and opportunities, but maybe where there is a market leader uh, that they could acquire for, you know, three, four times EBIT. Um, And then what they do is, you know, let's just say they buy a company for $30 $30 million in cash, or, you know, cash in stock, and the company's doing $40 million or $50 million a year in revenue, um, you know, they'll look to eliminate as many unnecessary costs and expenses as possible. You know, that's people, that might be marketing, that might be office space and, and lots of other stuff so that they're able to drop more of that revenue down to the bottom line, making these deals extremely accretive. 
Um, I think Mohawk got got knocked around in the recent sell off because they refinanced some debt at some pricey terms, eight percent interest rate with some warrants. But the CEO, uh, this guy Yaniv, has said that their pipeline pipeline of M and A deals is extremely strong. And it was worth paying a little bit more to get that that debt refinanced so that they can continue moving forward and close some of these deals so that investors can you know begin to appreciate this story once again. So, you know, the, the stock got the market cap got up to a billion dollars at one point. It's now down. I mean, the stock dropped. The stock is still 50 percent off the all time highs, which is just crazy to think about. Um, I mean, the, the company already gave their 2021 guidance of. $360 million, which is like 95 or 96% revenue growth over last year. And that didn't include any M&A. So, I mean, obviously with some M&A, we would see that number tick up, although we would obviously see more uh, more shares being offered as well. So, I mean, just because the revenue growth goes up, I mean, there's obviously this, the second part of the story is how many, sh- how many shares or is are being issued or how much cash is being used in order to generate that extra revenue but even, even without any m a i mean this is still a stock that's growing at a, you know growing the top line at 100 percent, and they're finally going to be profitable this year expecting about 31 million of ebitda so with the stock trading around 24 dollars, i believe i'd have to double check but i think it's maybe trading at 25 times ebitda with 100 percent top line growth and a and a 400 or 500 million dollar potential M&A pipeline like I, I just think the stock's way too cheap at 24 I mean this stock should be back in the the mid to high 30s pretty soon in my opinion and hopefully it gets there if we get some strong numbers some st- some strong Q1 numbers uh, my fifth largest position is Celsius so I added to so just in full disclosure I added to upstart this morning I added to Durham Tech I added to Mohawk I no I didn't add to Mohawk I added to Celsius. So Celsius is down 9% right now. Um, I think, (laughs) once again, most people probably know the story as I've I've explained it over and over for the last three months, but uh, I'm still very bullish on Celsius. You know, it it was probably due for a little bit of a pullback. The stocks had a nice run over the last three, four weeks. Um, got up into the mid 60s again earlier this week. So if you're looking to start a position in Celsius, um, I think on this 9% pullback today, not a bad time to start a position. Like I said, I added to my position today, right around 5650, I think it was. Um, So a lot of people know, I mean, energy drink space is competitive, but there's really four main players in the U.S. It's Red Bull and Monster, it's Bang, and now it's Celsius. And Celsius is growing 10 times faster than Monster and Red Bull. Uh, and Celsius, I, you know, I, lots of people say C-Limited is the three-headed monster. In my opinion, Celsius is like the three-headed monster of uh, the energy drink space because they're growing rapidly on e-commerce, primarily Amazon. They're growing rapidly in gyms right now that gyms are reopening gyms, studios, fitness centers. That was a big part of the business that got shut down last year. So gyms are coming back. And then, of course, retail. So as at the end of 2020, Celsius was in uh, they were I think they called it registered or approved or whatever uh, for 82,000 locations. Uh, This is Target and Walmart and Costco and Kroger and Speedway and you know, lots of other recognizable retail names. But, you know, it's important that they're getting into convenience and gas station because it's kind of shocking how many uh, grab and go cans are actually bought in those locations. But it's even more important that they're rolling out these branded coolers. So, you know, because grab and go is still so important for energy drinks, the last thing you want to do is walk into a convenience store or gas station and grab a warm energy drink off the shelf. Uh, so the, the fact that Celsius is introducing these branded coolers so that you can walk into one of those locations and grab a cold beverage is important. Obviously, there's also the branding that goes along with it. Um, and it just gives them some, you know, defined high traffic uh, space in a in a location. Um, I would expect Celsius gets pretty close to 100,000 locations this year. You know, last year, the company grew revenues at 74 percent. I think this year we'll probably see something at least over 60%, maybe close to 70% again, because the company has transitioned from DTR, which is direct to retailer, which means that, you know, if you're Kroger, for instance, and you're running low on Celsius in your store, 
uh, when you're doing DTR, that means Celsius is shipping their product to Kroger's distribution center. And then the product is going from the distribution center to the store. And someone from the store has to restock the shelves. That is that that is ripe with problems. And now they're doing DSD. So they have 150 DSD partners all over the country. Uh, a lot of them are actually Budweiser distributors. Um, and those DSD partners are actually delivering the product to the store themselves and shipping it themselves, uh, stocking it themselves, making sure that displays are correct, pricing is correct, um, promotions are correct, all of that. And they're incentivized uh, to make sure that, that all of that is happening correctly. So it's a big move for Celsius to get into DSD. Uh, part of the opportunity was created when Bang recently did a distribution deal with Pepsi. So then Bang walked away from a lot of their DSD partners and then those DSD partners, you know, uh, were willing to bring on Celsius because they no longer had a conflict of interest with Bang. So now Celsius is working with a lot of the distribution partners that helped Bang grow so fast the last few years. So there's a lot of reasons to still be um, very bullish on Celsius. It's not a cheap stock, I agree, but it doesn't mean it's ever going to be a cheap stock if it's if it's able to grow it you know, 55, 60, 65 percent for the next two or three years. Um, i trying to think, well, did I miss anything from the store? I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think you covered that really, really well. Um, for those who are listening to that and just heard a ton of amazing information and you were like me trying to jot down notes over here. Don't worry. We also have this recorded. Um, my good friend, Josh Meltzer, who's one of the analysts at Wolf Financial is recording this right now via screen record. Um, I just pinned to my profile. If you want to go check it out, I just pinned to my profile, um, the link to my YouTube. Uh, if you check it out, it's basically just recordings of Twitter spaces. Um, I have the one with Jonah from last week is on there. Um, I've got, uh, one that we did on the cannabis space earlier this week. That's up. Um, and a bunch of others that are just going to keep coming. So, um, there's been a lot of nice feedback from that. So feel free to check that out. Uh, that's currently pinned. Um, okay. We have a couple other stocks and stuff that we are going to go through. And also thank you for the, for the Futu info. I'm supposed to speak about them on Sunday. So that was pretty helpful for me and I'm very bullish on Futu as well. I love that business model. Um, all right. Question from Big Rig Trader. Oh, oh, and also thank you to the over 300 people who have been here and are listening and, you know, making this uh, a valuable time spent. Um, I know so, so many, you know, Christine, Stock Market, Parrot, Costa, Soul, um, fantastic shark to see everyone in here. Um, we even got like Slice in here, which is pretty cool. I love seeing like who pops in and hangs out. Um, you know, it's just like crazy to see who can come there, and who's interested. And there, like we've had, Slice, Slice uh, is one of the Ford, sponsors yeah. for the FinTwit contest. So big, big shout out to them. Mm. If you order, so the whole thing was, I don't know if anyone knows Slice that well. I mean, hopefully you do. Um, Slice is enabling the independent pizza shops, the mom and pop shops, like the true pizzerias, giving them a an opportunity, you know, to have a mobile, uh, a mobile experience with their customers, delivery, um, because at the end of the day, like if you're a pizza fan, like I am, I would always prefer a true pizzeria pizza over a Domino's pizza. So, or Papa Gino's or any of those other yeah. crappy brands. So F them go, go with the mom and pop shops. They always make a better pie. And, and one other thing before we get to the next question, and that is we mentioned Celsius, um, as always, I'm on a prayer here. Celsius sponsor my Twitter spaces, Jonah, make it happen. <laughs> Uh, we love Celsius out here. I own Celsius stock. All right. That's all I got to say so, on that. But, all right. So with, uh, with big Celsius, rig like I, I literally get 10 or 15 DMs a day from people that are like, it's just hilarious. They're walking into their grocery stores. They're walking to local convenience stores and they're actually asking the managers and owners about Celsius and how fast it's selling. And then they, they send me these DMs, you know, talking about the conversation and what was said. And I mean, I think it's close to a hundred percent of the time that manager or owner is telling them that they can't even keep Celsius in stock. It's, it's, it's selling so fast. They are shrinking their shelf space of their energy drinks in order to expand the shelf space for, um, for Celsius. So, I mean, by all measures, it sounds like Celsius is kicking ass right now. I just hope we see that come through in the numbers. I think it's just the DSD partners, um, you know, up and running. So, you know, even if Celsius disappoints on Q1 numbers and the stock sells off again, 
I would use that as a buying opportunity because it really doesn't change the long-term outlook. Absolutely. And the one other um, thing that I want to just shout out real quick is like, I, I posted about the Twitter space today and then I saw someone comment underneath and they tagged three of their friends and like said, are you going? And then everyone else replied and was like, we're excited for this. So it's really fun to see uh, soul. I think you were on that maybe. Yeah. Um, really just fun to see that type of stuff happening. Um, and the community coming together. I love to be a part of it. So going to big Greek's question, I think Jonah, you like this one. He asked, Jonah, um, what do you think about the IPA write-up that went out last night? Uh, I believe he wrote it about three weeks back, and the stock is up 5% yeah, I figured today. He, he, he's a big IPA fan. I, I can see a couple other people in the room that are big IPA fans as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't do a lot with biotech because it's just typically a very risky space where it's too binary. Uh, you know, either the drug gets FDA approval uh, and the stock price goes up 30 40 50%, maybe more. Or something goes wrong with the trials, you don't get FDA approval, and the stock drops 70, 80, 90 percent. You know, I've been on both sides of that, and it's it's pretty stressful. And too often, it's it's more of a guessing game than anything else. I think IPA is a little bit different because they have two different parts of the business. Uh, I retweeted that thread today on IPA. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, feel free to go look at it. Uh, IPA is a company based out of Canada. IPA is the ticker symbol. The name of the company is Amino Precise. The CEO is Jennifer Bath. I interviewed her a couple weeks ago. Um, that interview is available on my YouTube channel. And they have the two parts of the business. The first part is kind of the legacy part of the business. That's their CRO business, which stands for Contra Contract Research Organization. So that's where they're partnering with biotechs and pharmaceutical companies to help um, I guess, uncover, find uh, antibodies. Dis I guess discover is probably the right word. Discover antibodies that they can use in new drugs and therapeutics. But IPA has now launched this new part of the business, which they call ta Talum, T-A-L-E-M, Talum ther Therapeutics, where they're actually building up their own pipeline now of antibodies that they've discovered uh, and looking to license those antibodies out to the biotech and pharmaceutical companies. So, I mean, in a small way, it almost sounds like a conflict of interest, but I'm not an expert in the space, so I really don't know. Um, and I guess a lot of it depends on what those CRO clients are paying for, you know, what types of antibodies they're trying to find for what types of drugs. I believe it's a lot of, you know, cancer related drugs because that's where the big money is. But obviously, COVID and all these new variants has also created an opportunity for uh, antibodies in, in these cocktails, these therapeutic cocktails. So I think with IPA, you have like a you have like a nice floor, you know, like in terms of risk reward, there's limited risk because that CRO business, you know, is is still strong and probably keeps the stock propped up in the, you know, the high single digits range. And then you have that Telem Therapeutics as the, you know, the potential home run side of the business, where if they're actually able to license out one of their antibodies to a large pharmaceutical company in some sort of a royalty deal with an upfront payment and then a percentage of sales, you know, if those drugs turn out to be, you know, billion dollar blockbuster drugs, I mean, you're talking tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars of uh, licensing or royalty payments for IPA. So, and I don't think right now with the market cap of IPA at, let me see, um, yeah, under $200 million, I don't think any part of Talum is really being priced into the current stock price. So that's where you see the upside. I mean, and that's why I, I mentioned last night on the post or on the thread that IPA is not really a stock that you want to try to trade. Um, there's a lot of my stocks that I could trade, you know, just because they, they bounce around so much. IPA is one of those stocks, though, where you could wake up one morning and there's, you know, some big news and the stock could be up 50 percent and then you've missed your chance. So I just think it's one of those companies, if you're interested in the company, interested in the space, you know, I have a one and a half percent position to it. Um, I'm just kind of letting it sit in my account. And, you know, hopefully we get one of those big announcements one of these days. Absolutely. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Um, also, just let everyone know real quick. Uh, thank God this space is going fine has not crashed because i have less speakers if it does if my space has ever crashed i always make another space about 90 seconds later so just keep that in mind but hopefully i'll be able to chat with some people at twitter day and get that to stop happening all right jonah throwing a couple of smaller names at you just like 
uh, two, like two, three minutes on these names. Um, any thoughts on idea nomics? I, I really don't know it enough to comment. No worries. All right. Any thoughts on census healthcare? S R T S. All right. Fair enough. Uh, these are just questions I'm getting from people in the audience. Um, okay. So another question was, do you have any courses or are there any online courses that you recommend for people trying to learn chart analysis? Um, I mean, there are a bunch of people that I, I think put out great content. Uh, Trend Spider, where you know, that's actually the the charting software service that I use for, um, for all my technicals. Um, they, they put out a lot of content. They host weekly webinars and I believe it's probably all up on their YouTube channel. So I would check with trend spider, uh, Richard Mog, I think Moglin is how you pronounce his last name. Uh, he has a YouTube, YouTube channel where, you know, he does a, a bunch of his own videos where he goes through the technicals, and then he also interviews other investors where they can talk about their strategies. So, I mean, honestly, on YouTube, there's probably so much free content. I, I can't imagine you'd have to pay for a course. There's probably just there's just so much stuff out there nowadays. But I would th those are two that I would start with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Got a couple more DMs coming in. Uh, real quick, because I know we just talked a lot about CELH, but one other thing was someone asked if you know if CELH is being sold in Europe. Um, they said that they believe you talked about Norway and Finland, but wondered if they were going into France, Bulgaria, and Germany. Yeah, so I've talked to the head of sales before, and I mean, I think eventually they do want to get across all across Europe, but right now they're mostly focused in in those Nordic states, uh, states, um, Sweden, Norway. Uh, most of that was from the acquisition of a company called Funk Foods that they made a couple of years ago. Uh, it's, it's sort of the same thing in Asia. I mean, they have, um, I believe they have a partnership in Asia where they're working with a distributor over there. And it's more like a licensing deal because Celsius is really focused on just the U.S. right now. They're not, I don't believe they're even selling in Canada yet because a lot of people, you know, I see people tweeting all the time asking Celsius when they're coming to Canada. I mean, they're really, really focused on just the U.S. Um, and then these, you know, the, the Funk Foods deal uh, was kind of a strange one. I'm not going to get into the details of, of how or why it happened, but that's really the only reason that they're selling in Norway and Sweden right now. And it's, act, it's, it's a similar, it's not the exact same products that we have in the U.S. It's, it's actually a, a somewhat different product, different flavors, and completely different can. Got it. Okay, got another little bit of a longer question for you. Um, so this was from Stephanie Seven. So if Stephanie Seven's in here, there's your shout out. Uh, they said that they believe that you are invested in Neo, uh, but they don't see you often talking about it. Um, they're wondering what price do you see for Neo stock? Uh, by the end of the year and three years out, they just announced that they are entering Norway, which is one of the biggest EV markets in Europe, and they're expected to announce positive results at the end of the week. There has uh, been plenty of other positive NEO announcements of late. So I guess just your thoughts on NEO short term. Yeah, long -term. I mean, I, I, I have a small position in NEO. I've reduced it a little bit over the last couple of weeks. I mean, it's, it's still a Chinese company, so there's still that risk on the table. Um there, you know, there are multiple EV companies in China that are competing with Neo. So I don't think the market is it's not just Neos to win. Um, like in, I think in the U.S., it's pretty clear that Tesla is the, you know, is the dominant player when it comes to EVs. And then Tesla is also over in China as well. Um, Neo is is growing at over 100 percent. I mean, they're going to put up numbers this quarter that are just eye popping but remember that you know the numbers that they report right now q1 uh, 2021 are you know that's year over year so you're coming off of a 2020 first quarter where china was basically shut down because of covid you know where so if you didn't have a lot of auto sales in q1 of last year and then you know the economy is obviously reopened over there now you know you're going to get some just ridiculous um, quarter over quarter numbers, similar to what we saw from Zoom. I mean, the numbers that we see from from Neo today will look similar to the numbers that we got from Zoom at the peak of the pandemic. Um, but you know, over the course of the next three quarters, those numbers are going to come way down because uh, China was obviously opening up last year quicker than we were. 
So, you know, this year, total revenue growth, I'd, I'd have to double check. It means it's going to be somewhere probably low triple digits. Um, I'm also not convinced that China is going to let Tesla really succeed over there. I still think, I mean, I'm not an expert on the on China or the CCP, but I can't imagine they love the idea of Tesla coming over there and and taking any significant market share from their other domestic auto companies, including NEO. So I would expect the CCP to make things more difficult for Tesla to succeed in China. And if that happens, then, you know, NEO would be one of the beneficiaries of that. NEO has also said that they're, they're going into Europe as well. So it's, I mean, this, like, <laughs> if anyone remembers what, you know, where NEO was trading last uh, March at the lows, I believe the stock got under $3 a share. Um, so the stock sold way, way off uh, at the bottom. And it's obviously bounced back pretty significantly. It's now trading in the, was it in the 40s? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's down two percent, down five percent today. So Neo just dropped below forty. I don't know. This is a really hard one to 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 put a valuation and a price target on. Um, and then the, the risk right now is these chip shortages. So I don't know if anyone heard what Ford the Ford CEO said yesterday. I was I'm like I still can't even believe it. The Ford C, you know Ford uh, announced earnings last night, which were disappointing, but it's primarily because of this chip shortage. And the CEO said that. I think he said Q2, Ford will produce 50% less cars than previously expected because of the chip shortage. And then the second half of the year, it's going to be at least 10% lower because of the chip shortage. And all in, uh, the Ford CEO says they expect to produce 1.1 million less cars this year because of the chip shortage. Like, I didn't, I mean, I knew the chip shortage was a big deal. I didn't realize it was going to wipe out 1.1 million car sales uh, for for Ford. And I believe I heard that that's a two and a half billion dollar hit to their bottom line. I don't know if it's top line or bottom line. I have to run the numbers again, but I think it was bottom line. And that's just that's mind blowing. So, you know, the fact that all of these cars, including Neo's cars, are getting more high tech and they need more chips that's one of the reasons that I just don't pump up Neo because I'm afraid that one of those announcements might come down the pipeline and then the stock sells off 15 or 20%. So, you know, this chip shortage is a bigger deal than Got people it. realize. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I've definitely been looking more into that chip shortage. And I also see that Ford is down about 10% today. Although I know most people who are in Ford are in it more for that, that dividend usually of that 5.36% yield than the stock return. Um, okay, pretty interesting. All right, so Lamont, he's back on. So he DM me a question. So I'm going to ask his question because he's in here. Um, and I'm going to kind of combine it with another question that someone's like sent me three <laughs> times. They've said, please ask this oh, in my God. DMs. So I'm just going to ask it. Because uh, we already we already talked about DMTK a bunch, but we'll just do a little bit more on DMTK, which is, um, so the first person wanted to know if you could talk about the risk versus reward of investing in DMTK. And Lamont, a little bit more specifically wanted to know um, if you could touch on how genetic sequencing could displace Dermtex yeah, products. I'm, I'm not an expert on um, genetic sequencing. So that's not even a topic that I'm, I'm going to jump into. Just not my, not even close to my area of expertise. There's a, you know, I don't want to say a million, but there's a lot of people out there that are much, much smarter on that subject than me. Um, I mean, the risk to Dermtex. So, I mean, there's risk to any stock, you know, especially small caps. Um You know, I think right now the biggest risk is adoption by dermatologists. Um, You know, they were all trained to do things a certain way. I mean, this is true in in any medical profession. And if you are trained as a dermatologist where, you know, you use your eyes to basically determine if you think a, a mole or a pigmented lesion is suspicious. And if you think it's really suspicious, then you would order a biopsy. If you think it's just sort of suspicious and you want to keep an eye on it, you know, you set up a, you know, an appointment with that patient three, six months down the road. Uh, sometimes you might take a picture of it so that you can, you know, more easily compare the, the current um, mole to the, you know, the mole that you take a picture of in three to six months. Um, and that's kind of how dermatology has always operated. So, you know, when this company like Dermtech comes around and wants to completely flip things upside down with these genomic smart patches, um, it's going to take a little while for the dermatologist to get on board with that. You know, I've, I've heard mixed results from dermatologists or, 
people that I, you know, that have gone into my DMs and said, oh, I was at my dermato- dermatologist's office last week and I asked them about Derm Tech and, you know, they weren't really excited about it. But, you know, it also comes down to the money. You know, how much money are they getting back on, you know, how much money are they making on the, the biopsies versus, you know, what's their kickback on the patches. But, you know, I think when people say that, I think they, they're losing sight of what, you know, d- what whatever the dermatologist loses, you know, whatever the difference is between their, you know, their profit margin on the biopsy versus their kickback on the patch. Um, a lot of that could be made up just in quantity because, you know, there's 4 million biopsies. Like I already much mentioned this. I mean, there's 4 million biopsies in the, in the U S every year, over 90% of them come back negative. Um, it's possible that those dermatologists would are, have more suspicions about more moles but they're just apprehensive about continuing to cut into people with a 90% negative rate. So, you know, perhaps the, the patch can sort of, you know, create some extra revenues for the dermatologist where they see a suspicious mole, but maybe it's not suspicious enough to cut into it yet. That's where you can use the patch. Um, So I think dermat, I think there's a, Mm -hmm. you know, there's certainly a place for both. Um, and certainly if the patches come back and show some, some issues, then that's when you would want to follow up with a biopsy. So the patches are not replacing all biopsies. They're just kind of replacing those fringe biopsies, um, or perhaps, you know, like, I don't know what the the next level is above fringe, but you know, like if, if, if it's like, I don't even, I, I don't know the, I don't know the, the wording that they use, but if it's not suspicious enough to order a biopsy, you know, whatever before that suspicion is, you know, that's where maybe you, you use the patches, but I mean, Derm Tech's trying to build an entire platform, a skin genomics platform where it's not just the PLA product, you know, like I said, it's going to be Luminate, it's going to be carcinome, and that's where the dermatologist can really increase their revenues because every time a patient comes into their office, I mean, if you think that patient is is suffering from significant UV damage, why not order one of these Derm Tech, you know, these these Luminate um, products or patches in order to give that patient a true diagnosis of their skin? Um, And then based on that diagnosis, then the dermatologist can make even more money by, you know, doing, um, you know, laser treatments or um, skin, you know, peels or whatever the hell they're called or, you know, um, selling them, you know, prescription, um, uh, topicals or creams or any of that stuff. So like, I think once the dermatologist realized that derm tech's trying to help them as well as the patient, uh, and that there's plenty of money to go around. I mean, derm, derm tech is not trying to replace the dermatologist. They want the dermatologist to be part of this, you know, this entire platform or system. So I just, you know, and then, and then throw mm-hmm. on top of that, the pandemic, you know, where Derm Tech has 30, 40, 50 sales reps around the country, you know, when offices are closed, it's kind of hard for those sales reps to get out to the dermatologist and actually talk to them face to face and show them the patch. And, um, you know, th- those sales, it's, it's harder to do those sales over Zoom or over the phone. So, you know, as we get back to a, a life of normalcy and the pandemic is, is over soon, I think it'll be easier for Derm Tech to get their sales reps into these these top dermatology centers. Right, right, definitely. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna just finish up with a couple more questions, and then uh, I do have to hop to another call. But this is coming from Soul, so thanks for being in here, Soul, and hyping us up. And she wants to know if you still uh, believe that there's time to get into TMDX. Yep. So I'm most likely getting back into TMDX pretty soon. I sold it. I think it was three weeks ago. Um, I'll actually tell you right now because I can look it up. Um, give me two seconds. So I sold TMDX. What day was that? Um, yeah, earlier this month. So, you know, in the next 10 days or so, probably, I'll be able to get back into TMDX. And I'll be, you know, I took a tax loss. So the tax loss that I took on TMDX uh, we'll be able to offset some of the gains I took this year on some of my other positions like food to an upstart. So I think don't the people that criticized me for, for selling germ um, transmedics a month ago, honestly have no idea what the hell they're talking about. They obviously don't understand the, the value and the benefit of tax harvesting as well. So if you, you know, 
if you take short term gains in stocks, you can offset those gains with short term losses. So in a situation like Transmedics, where you have a two to three month, you know, kind of wait time between the FDA panel and the FDA decision, since I took a tax loss or I had a loss on Transmedics, I was able to sell that stock, take the tax loss, wait the 31 days, get back into Transmedics before we get to the FDA decision. And that was my whole plan. And hopefully it's going to work out in my favor because I'm still bullish on Transmedics long term. Um, so just be, and what, this goes back to my very first point today. Just because I sell or trim a stock doesn't mean I'm not bullish on it long term. It just means there's a reason for doing so in the short term, whether it's a tax loss, whether it's the stock has just run up way too fast and I'm, and I'm just expecting a pullback and I don't want to sit there and deal with a 20 percent pullback. So I'd rather lock in my gains now, put that cash somewhere else and then get back on the get back in on the pullback. Like that's proper portfolio management. And, and too many people do not understand this. So they would rather rather than try to understand it, they would just rather criticize you and call you names and harass you because you sold a stock that you liked three or four weeks ago. So uh, yes, I do still love Transmedics. Yes, I still plan on getting back in uh, sometime in early May, is, which is, you know, I guess just a few days away. But I think it's, uh, I think the second week in May is when I can get back into Transmedics and still use that loss. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, fantastic answer to that. And for those who are unfamiliar, I definitely uh, would say to look into offsetting your losses on cap, but offsetting your capital gains with losses from stocks. Um, it's something I actually used to do a lot for some of my clients at Goldman Sachs was to take a stock in the portfolio, sell it. You want to do this for essentially 31 days, which is called a wash period. Um, oftentimes what we would do is just replace it. So if someone has, I don't know, Coke, we put Pepsi in for 31 days. Um, just to keep the integrity of the portfolio. And then after the 31 days are up, you can go ahead, you can buy that stock back. However, you're able to write off that loss from your capital gain so you can pay less taxes. Um, all right, Jonah, it's 1245. We've been running for a whole hour. Uh, my DM are chock full of more questions. So I would say we should do this again next week. <laughs> sure. You think you're up for it? I mean, I, I can go 15 okay. minutes longer if you can. Sound like... Yeah. Uh, I have a meeting with Twitter at one and my dog is giving me the hairy eye that she wants me to okay. take her out first. Uh, so <laughs> I might, uh, I might go ahead and take my dog out. My mom's on here listening. So she's going to appreciate that, <laughs> that I'm saying I'm going to take my dog out. Uh, so shout out mom for, for listening in on this. This was recorded. I uh, hope everybody had a fantastic time and enjoyed as always. I am your host, Gov Blacksburg. Uh, make sure that you're checking out Jonah's stuff. He is the real G over here and he's having so much knowledge that he's chopping and sharing with us. Uh, me and Jonah are both going to be speaking on a Twitter space on Sunday. That is going to be starting at 2 PM hosted by Max Bezenko. I'm also going to have a Twitter space tomorrow at 5 p.m. EST. Uh, on that Twitter space tomorrow at 5 p.m. EST, I'm going to have Simon Erickson, who's the CEO of 7investing. I'm going to have Luke Jacoby, um, Rehar Jark, Gannon Breslin is going to be on there. Um, it's just going to be a completely loaded panel. So um, continue to stay in touch with the Wolfpack. I appreciate everyone who's followed me um, you know, during during this call. Uh, hope, hopefully, you know, one day I'll have, a, I'll have a following like Jonas. Who knows? Um, but for now, that is all I have for today. Uh, Jonah, is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience uh, before we go? If Bill Belichick is, is listening. Uh, please go get Jimmy G or draft a quarterback tonight. Cause I don't want Cam Newton as my starter. As long as they don't get Justin That's, Fields, I'm good with it. I, I wouldn't mind. Why are you a Pats fan? Oh, no, no, no. I'm a Ravens I, fan. I, Cause I, I kind of want <laughs> fields. I think he's uh he'd be a pretty dynamic by dynamic quarterback for us. No, I don't. I don't want you to get Fields. <laughs> He's too good for the Patriots. I don't need another dynasty. Chill I just, out for I, a few I years. Cam, Cam Newton's a little washed right. out. So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, he is. All right, all right. That's all we got for today. I really look forward to chatting with everyone again soon. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in. Thank you, Jonah, for doing this with us. I'm looking forward to doing it with you Sounds again good, next man. week. Take care, everybody. Have a good week.